Good evening, everyone. Hope that the uh, engine noise doesn't interfere with the video, but it's uh, almost 90 degrees out today, and I have the air conditioning running, so I'm comfortable. But in this video, I'm going to talk about uh, something that uh, I've been wanting to talk about for a very long time, and that is this notion that the Jews rejected Jesus. Is that true? Is that something that's taught in the Bible? Well, consider this, that Jesus, his ministry, when he first started his ministry, who did he go to first? He went to his own people, the Jews. In fact, if you go to John chapter 8, verse 31 and 32, we read, and I have it right here, and I'll put it on the screen so you can follow along. Jesus said here, notice the first three words, to the Jews who had believed him, Jesus said, if you hold to my teaching, you are really my disciples, then you will know the truth and the truth will set you free. Now I've addressed in previous videos what the Jews would be freed from, but in this video, I'm talking about who Jesus went to first. The 12 men that Jesus chose were Jews. And Jesus' first disciples were Jews, a great many of them. We don't know their numbers, but he made many disciples among his own people, Jews. So the Jews did not reject Jesus as many today would like to believe or have you believe. That is not true. In fact, Jesus says something else, and I have this is at uh, John chapter 10, down at uh, verse uh, 16. He uh, in that context of chapter 10, Jesus is talking about uh, the good shepherd. But uh, here at verse 16, I'll put it on a screen for you. Jesus says, I have other sheep that are not of this sheep pen, not of this sheep pen. So who are the first ones to enter into that sheep pen? The Jews. Most of Christ's disciples were Jews. So the Jews did not reject Jesus. Now, who are these other sheep that he refers to here at uh, John chapter 10, verse 16? Well, these would be the Gentiles who would become his followers. And we must also keep in mind that who drove those nails through his hands? They weren't Jews. These were Romans. They were Gentiles. So in a sense, they rejected Jesus. Now, were there Jews who rejected Jesus? Yes, of course. The Pharisees didn't like him. The Sadducees didn't like him, but some did. Uh, Nicodemus, he was a Pharisee. He didn't seem to have a problem with Jesus. He asked him many questions. The Pharisee Gamaliel there at, uh, chapter, at Acts chapter 5 came to the defense of Jesus' disciples, did he not? So we must put all this into context, that the first ones to enter into discipleship with Jesus were his 12 apostles, the ones that he chose, all Jews, and those who were among the Jewish people who became his disciples. And even after he ascended, the apostle Paul, the apostle Paul was a very devout Jew. Of course, he was known as Saul of Tarsus, but he was zealous. He was a devout Jew. So it would be incorrect to say that Jews rejected Jesus. And on the other side of that coin, Gentiles rejected him as well. Even to this day, there are persons who are both Jews and Gentiles who still reject Jesus. Is this true or is this false? It is Christianity uh, who would have you believe that uh, the Jews rejected Jesus. Don't believe that. Uh, Christianity, and I don't mind saying this because I was in it, uses lots of sleight of hand. Christianity is a very proud religious system. It doesn't like to be shown up or exposed as being wrong. It has to be right about everything. Uh, it will even lie and embellish to make itself appear as if it is truthful. Now, does Christianity speak and teach truthful things? Yes but it teaches a great many things that are in error, which means out of ignorance, just not knowing, but it also teaches a great many things, a great many things that are simply lies. In other words, 
knowingly. I have a very difficult time with individuals who position themselves over people. They're quoting scripture and they're very good at it. How can they not read certain things that Jesus says that shows that Jesus is not God, for example, or that uh, there is no uh, literal eternal hellfire? I saw a video the other day where an individual was, I believe, outright defiant against uh, what Christ taught. Uh, the video was entitled, Where Was Jesus for Those Three Days? Well, that's not complicated. Jesus was not only the Son of God, he was also the Son of Man, born of a woman, flesh and blood. Jesus died. He was dead for three days in his grave. But the individual in that video was saying, no, he was down there preaching and talking to dead souls. You know what? That makes no sense because when he was alive, he did that. He talked to persons who were alive and persons who knew that they would die. Jesus took care of it. He died for all persons. That's why all, according to Jesus, at John chapter 5, verses 28 and 29, all will have a resurrection from the dead. And he used uh, the parable of the uh, rich man and the beggar Lazarus. I did a video on that. Please check it out. Please check it out. He was saying to, those, to his, to his uh, subscriber base that uh, that was literal, that uh, the uh, rich man and the beggar Lazarus were real people that the rich man was in a literal hell where he was being tormented, that makes no sense. Because we're told that both of those persons died. The rich man died and the beggar Lazarus died. Jesus was speaking in parable there. So the things that one read in that account, they're symbolic. The rich man represents the Pharisees who despise the common Jewish people, represented by Lazarus. When they both died, what we're seeing there is a change of circumstances. The rich man, it would appear, was uh, had God's favor because he had lots of money, he had lots of wealth. So it, it gave the appearance that God blessed him, but didn't bless Lazarus. But when they both died, things got flipped around. The beggar Lazarus was in the bosom position of the father. So the rich man who it appeared who was in God's favor now found himself not in God's favor. The ones that was despised, that was the common Jewish people represented by Lazarus, found themselves in God's favor. So be careful when you hear persons out there who talk about this wealth ministry stuff that that God blesses a people by giving them material things. Don't believe that. Jesus wasn't rich. He didn't have a place to lay his head. But the individuals talking about that as being something literal, and also consider this too, that the rich man begged God, Father Abraham, to send Lazarus to him with a drop of water on his finger to place on his tongue to cool his tongue. Does that make sense? Why would he not ask for a cup of water? Better yet, why not ask for a raging river to pour down into that area if it's indeed a place of intense heat and torment? But he asked for a drop of water? And if Lazarus could do that literally, would not the drop of water on Lazarus' hand, on his finger rather, evaporate? It would not Lazarus himself burn up. See, it makes no sense. And also, if hell is a place of intense torment and fire and heat, how is it that this man, this rich man who had died, was able to see and talk and feel heat? It does not align itself with scriptures that uh, persons who push this notion of eternal torment in a, uh, a fiery hell, it doesn't align itself with what's written, say, at Ecclesiastes chapter 9, um, verses 5 and 10. So the individual uh, used that uh, to show that Jesus, when he died, was down there talking to people. No, Jesus died. So Jesus was dead for three days. What Jesus showed was that one can get out of 
hell. I'm sorry, what is hell? It is a tomb. It is our grave. When I die, I go to hell. When you die, you go to hell. You go into the grave. Jesus showed that one can come out of hell, come out of the grave. Is that not what he said there at John chapter 5, verses 28 and 29? He said, don't be amazed at this, yet many are amazed at it. But Jesus says, don't be amazed at this. For all in their graves, that is hell, will hear his voice and come out. Jesus showed if he died and was resurrected, all of us that he died for, as each and every person to ever breathe air, will die, thanks to Adam. But thanks to Jesus, they can come out of the grave back to life again not eternal life that must be earned but at least jesus died so that we will have a chance to live again and then have the prospect of earning for ourselves and working out for ourselves with fear and trembling eternal life going through that great tribulation in future days and coming out of it as we read there at uh, revelation chapter 7 the elder asked uh, the imprisoned Apostle John, who are those dressed in the white robes? John didn't know. John said, you, you know, sir. So the elder told him, the elder told him that these are those who come out of the great tribulation. They've washed their robes white in the blood of the lamb. And if you continue reading in that chapter, Revelation chapter seven, those who come out of the great tribulation sing a song. It's a special song. That has meaning. That song is something like we owe salvation to our God and the Lamb. See? That song is not sung before the Great Tribulation. It's only sung after they come out of the Great Tribulation. They're giving tribute to God and the Lamb for saving them. So it is only when one comes out of the Great Tribulation, that's yet future, that's many hundreds of years yet future. When one comes out of that, then they'll be saved. And that's what Jesus said at Matthew chapter 10, verse 22. The one who endures to the end will be saved. No one today is saved with regards to eternal life. Everyone's sins are forgiven because Jesus died for all of our sins, whether you accept them or not. What people are saved into is a promise a guarantee that when they die the resurrected from the dead and when they come out of the grave they come out with a clean slate there will be no sin counted towards them and that's what the apostle paul taught at romans chapter 6 verse 23 the apostle paul taught that the wages sin pays its death so our deaths are full payment for any sins that we commit in this lifetime that doesn't mean that we have a license to sin that will be disrespectful. We would show appreciation for what Jesus did for us. So I got off track a little bit there, but the main point here is that the Jews did not reject Jesus. They're Jews today. And I mean, literal Jews here in the United States, all over the world, in the nation state of Israel, who accept Jesus. But one must keep in mind that the first flock that Jesus pulled his disciples from, or made disciples from, were the Jews. He chose 12 men, they became his apostles, they were Jews. Then the other disciples in his ministry were all Jews as well. Then when his ministry went to the Gentiles, then the Gentiles, when the Gentiles became his disciples. So it would not be correct to think or to believe that the Jews rejected Jesus. Now, this is R. Jerome Harris. Thank you for listening.